Over the past several sessions, I placed a great deal of emphasis on the importance of the hands. To a certain extent, we can think of the discussion of the upper limb as being a lead-in for this crucial topic, serving as a means of positioning the hand to accomplish a given task. Well, much like the anticipated release of the Force Awakens, the wait is finally over. Time to find out what makes this region of the body so important. Good day, and welcome to this Gross Anatomy video podcast series. I'm Dr. Stuart Ingalls, and I know, bear with me, this is probably going to be around for quite some time. Today, we're going to conclude our discussion of the upper limb by looking at the terminal portion to the hand. It's hard to think of a day day task that doesn't require, in some way or another, the use of our hands. Probably the most important aspect of hand movement is a simple yet dramatic biological design. The fact that the joints of our thumbs are rotated by 90 degrees such that the pads of our thumbs face medially towards the palm of our hands. This is the prehensile or opposable thumb, and it provides humans with manual dexterity that is unmatched in the animal kingdom. Although it accounts for only a very small amount of total volume of muscle in the upper limb, the amount of motor cortex in the brain dedicated to the movements of the hand is actually greater than the amount dedicated to all the other compartments of the upper limb combined. Here's a little activity for you. Try going a full day with your thumb taped to the index finger, preventing you from using it properly. See how difficult that day becomes without full functional use of your hands. For the first session, we're going to start, as we usually do, with a look at the osteology and the arthrology of the hand, identifying the subtle and pronounced movements that are possible. We'll also look at some radiographs and make some correlations to the bony framework. We start our discussion of the hand with a look at the bones, beginning with those of the wrist. The carpal bones, as they are known, articulate with the radius proximally and the metacarpal bones distally. The anterior and posterior surfaces of the bones are roughened for attachment of tendons and ligaments, while the remaining surface is generally smooth for articulation. The carpal bones are arranged in two rows containing four bones apiece. Starting with the proximal row, we have the scaphoid on the most lateral side. It gets its name for its boat-shaped appearance, having a concave distal surface and concavex proximal surface. The bone is separated into proximal and distal portions by a neck region, and a prominent tubercle is often observed in the palmar surface for attachment of the transverse carpal ligament. The smooth proximal surface articulates extensively with the distal surface of the radius, and the convex surface articulates with four of the other carpal bones. The lunate gets its name for its moon-shaped appearance. It lies medial to the scaphoid with which it articulates through the concave surface. The lunate also contributes to the wrist joint, articulating with the triangular disc in a neutral hand position. The triquetrium is named for its pyramidal appearance. Although it's part of the proximal row of carpal bones, it does not actually contribute to the wrist joint in a neutral wrist position. It's only when the wrist is in ulnar deviation that a small portion of the triquetrium articulates with the articular disc covering the ulna. The triquetrium articulates with the lunate laterally, the hamate distally, and the pisiform anteriorly. The pisiform is so named because of its P-shaped appearance. Although it is considered to be part of the first row of carpal bones, it actually sits on a separate plane anterior to the other bones. Its only articulation is with the triquetrium posteriorly. The pisiform serves as a sesamoid bone, floating within the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris discussed in the previous class. Along with the hook of the hamate, it forms a lateral elevation, providing protection to the ulnar nerve, which courses through this area, and a lateral anchor for the transverse carpal ligament, which serves as the root of the carpal tunnel. Moving into the distal row of carpal bones, we find the trapezium laterally. The name is derived from the Latin for little table, for its role in supporting the first metacarpal on the scaphoid. Its distal articular surface is saddle-shaped, forming a saddle joint with the complementary surfaces on the first metacarpal bone. This carpal-metacarpal articulation is critical in thumb opposition and the versatility of hand function. Articulating with the medial surface of the trapezium is the trapezoid bone. 
Its name reflects its geometric shape. It articulates with the scaphoid proximally and the second metacarpal distally. The capitate, or head bone, is the largest of all the carpal bones. It gets its name for the shape of its proximal projection, which articulates with the scaphoid and lunate. It forms the keystone of the carpal bones, articulating with the trapezoid and hamate laterally and medially, and with the third metacarpal distally. The last of the carpal bones is the hamate bone. Its most distinctive feature is the hamulus, or hook, that projects from the palmar surface, which gives the bone its name. Along with the pisiform, this forms the superior portion of the medial wall of the carpal tunnel and serves as an attachment point for the transverse carpal ligament. Again, we can use our mnemonics to remember the names in order of the carpal bones, starting with row 1 on the lateral side. The first letter of each bone combines to form the expression scared lovers try positions that they can't handle. And no, I did not make that one up. The metacarpals are the bones associated with the distal aspect of the hands. Although small, they each have the typical characteristics of long bones. The base of each bone is situated proximally. The articular surface is irregular, forming gliding joints with the carpal bones. The one exception is the saddle-shaped first metacarpal, which as previously stated forms a saddle joint with the trapezium. Distally, we find the metacarpal heads which form the knuckles of the hand whenever one makes a fist. They have an ellipsoid appearance which is important for normal finger motion. The phalanges make up the fingers. Although even smaller in size than the metacarpals, they are still classified as long bones due to their characteristic features. Each digit is associated with three phalanges, with the exception of the first digit, which has only two. The proximal phalange articulates with the metacarpals through condyloid-style joints that permit movements in two planes, flexion extension and abduction adduction. All interphalangeal joints are hinge joints in nature, allowing only flexion extension movements. The accompanying image assists with getting a grasp on the orientation of each of these bones in relation to the surface anatomy. It's recommended that you take a few moments to hold out your own hand and palpate the structures for a comparison. Notice, among other things, how compact the carpus is in comparison with the metacarpus. We started our discussion of the radiocarpal or wrist joint in the previous lesson indirectly with our discussion of the proximal articulating surfaces. It's now time to complete this picture. Here we can see the proximal articulating surface once again, made up of the radius and articulating disc. Distally, the scaphoid and the lunate are primarily responsible for articulation of the wrist joint in a neutral position. When in radial deviation, there is greater contact between the radius and the scaphoid, while ulnar deviation allows some articulation between the triquetrium and the articular disc. The radiocarpal joint is heavily reinforced with a fibrous capsule containing extensive intercapsular ligaments, including a radiocollateral and ulnar collateral ligament. The joint is condyloid in structure. It permits flexion and extension, but also abduction and adduction. Again, note that there is no rotation allowed. This occurs at the proximal and distal radioulnar joints. In the previous lesson, we discussed the roles the various muscles play in radial and ulnar deviation. The image on the left provides a visual representation for the purpose of understanding. A combination of flexor muscle contraction produces flexion, and extensor muscle contraction produces extension. Conversely, contraction of flexor and extensor carpi ulnaris muscles produces ulnar deviation, or adduction, while contraction of flexor and extensor carpi radialis produces radial deviation, or abduction. While the distinct movements at the wrist joint is appreciated even by young children, the subtle movements within the intercarpal joints is grossly underestimated. All of the intercarpal joints, as well as the carpal metacarpal joints, are encased within a common synovial sheath and fibrous joint capsule. This means that while movements between planar joints are minimal, there is sufficient slack in the capsule to accommodate slightly greater motions between these joints. In addition, there is a curved yet continuous plane of alignment in the joint spaces separating the proximal and distal rows of carpal bones. These separated articulations are therefore collectively referred to as the mid-carpal joint. <laughs> 
This allows for a greater amount of movement than would be expected in a segment of smaller staggered gliding joints. For example, mid-carpal joint glide is necessary to achieve a greater degree of both wrist extension and radial deviation than would be seen if there was no glide between these bones. While gliding also occurs during flexion and ulnar deviation, it does not provide as great a contribution. These subtle motions are not insignificant. Following the removal of an arm cast, for example, the lack of mobility for such an extended period of time results in retractions and adhesions within the joint capsule. This results in significant deficits in thumb opposition and general use of the appendage. One of the focuses of rehabilitation is therefore the mobilization of these intercarpal joints to promote normal hand function. As previously stated, the carpometacarpal joints represent planar type joints that are reinforced by numerous anterior and posterior ligaments. Movement is therefore highly limited in these regions. The one exception is the saddle joint between the trapezium and the first metacarpal. The name is derived from the fact that each surface is concave in one direction and convex in another, similar to riding in a saddle. When oriented at 90 degrees to one another, the articular surfaces conform, allowing flexion extension and abduction-adduction motions. This architecture, combined with a looser joint capsule, permits motions not seen at the other carpal metacarpal joints, including thumb opposition. The metacarpal phalangeal joints are a type of condyloid joint, which again permits motion in two separate directions. This again allows for flexion extension and abduction-adduction. The interphalangeal joints, on the other hand, are a classic hinge-type joint which allows for flexion and extension, but not abduction and adduction. Abduction and adduction at the interphalangeal joints is uh, not generally a desirable thing. Time to look at medical imaging of the hand. Once again, very busy, particularly in the carpal region, where there is extensive overlap of different bony structures. Notice, for example, that in the AP view, the pisiform bone sits entirely in front of the trochoetrium, and that there is substantial overlap between the trapezium and trapezoid bones. It takes time, but as you get used to looking at radiographs and comparing them to what is observed in the hand, you'll begin to get a sense of the three-dimensional orientation of these structures. Some other things to take note of in these images. First, Note the apparent space between the distal surface of the ulna and the articular surface of the lunate and triquetrium. Remember, this is the location of the articular disc, which is radiolucid in standard plane film radiograph, meaning that it's usually indistinguishable from the background. Also note the hook of the hamate, defining the medial half of the carpal tunnel. Finally, take a look at the shape of the scaphoid bone especially of the neck region that shows up particularly well in the oblique radiographic view. We'll come back to the clinical significance of this bone in just a moment. Most of these movements of the hand are pretty straightforward and were summarized in the review lectures at the start of the course. Other movements need a little clarification. For example, remember that the movement of a finger away from the midline through the middle finger is considered abduction and movement towards is adduction. Also of occasional confusion is the movement of the thumb. Because the thumb is rotated 90 degrees relative to the other fingers, the movements at this joint are also rotated. Therefore, movements in the frontal or coronal plane are considered flexion extension movements, while movements in the sagittal plane are considered abduction adduction movements. Considering our reliance on our hands, it shouldn't be surprising that this region is subject to a number of clinical complications that can have a dramatic impact on our day-to-day -day function. Some of these are related to fractures to the bones that we have just discussed. The most common of which is the scaphoid fracture. This injury typically results from a foosh or a fall on an outstretched hand event. As force is transferred through the body of the scaphoid, there is a risk of fracture to the neck region which represents a weak point in the bone structure. As discussed in the previous lesson, the anatomical snuff box is an important landmark for palpation of the scaphoid, and therefore pain within this region is indicative of this type of injury. A radiograph will often confirm the presence of a fracture. The clinician should be looking for a disruptive line, most commonly in the neck region, which we identified in the oblique radiographic view.
A variety of treatment options are available, including cast immobilization or internal fixation, depending on the degree of displacement and physician preference. It is significant to note that the instances of negative radiographic findings in the acute phase of the injury are incredibly high. Point tenderness in the anatomical snuff box following a FUSH event is often still considered a sufficient diagnosis of a scaphoid fracture. There are two reasons for this approach. First is the low sensitivity of the radiographic diagnosis. Quite often, the radiologic report finds a false negative result, an inability to correctly identify the presence of a fracture line. Here is a radiograph of a 35-year-old woman who complained of point tenderness after falling off her bike. Notice a very faint fracture line through the scaphoid that could be easily missed. Here's another radiographic view of a confirmed scaphoid fracture. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't see a fracture line at all. The second relates to the anatomical vascular supply to the scaphoid. In most individuals, the scaphoid is supplied by a single nutrient artery off the radial artery, which enters the distal pole and passes through the neck to the proximal pole. Failure to accurately diagnose and immobilize a scaphoid fracture may lead to improper union at the fracture site and vascular compromise to the proximal pole, resulting in avascular necrosis and ultimately osteoarthritis and compromised wrist function. Here we see osteoarthritis in bone spurs growing around an older fracture site, and this image demonstrates the consequence of avascular necrosis. Notice the radiolucidity of the proximal pole of the scaphoid due to the loss of bone mineral density. Another common type of fracture is the metacarpal neck, colloquially known as the boxer's fracture. As the name implies, the injury results from impact forces on a clenched fist, as when punching an object. If improper technique is used, the force is directed obliquely across the metacarpal bones, creating shear forces that result in this type of fracture. The fourth and fifth metacarpals are the most commonly affected. Treatment is typically conservative using splints or casts, and prognosis is generally very good. More severe fractures or fractures to multiple bones may require internal fixation techniques for proper healing to occur. That's all for this first session on the bones and joints of the hand. As usual, in the next session, we'll focus on the musculature of the hand and how each muscle generates its movement. See you after the break. 